Hi guys, welcome back. We shall now be talking about a topic that is snake bite. And when you worked in tertiary care, you have worked in peripheral centers, you would have noticed that this is one case which is a difficult one to handle, especially because of the complications that are associated with anti-snake venom. So let's just discuss how to effectively manage this case. First and foremost, you need to be aware of the standard snakes which are found in India and the anti-snake venom will be working on them. The first snake is obviously easy for you to recognize thanks to Indian movies, that is the Cobra. The second one is also going to contribute to neurotoxicity, that is a crate. So when it comes to Cobra and crate, they are easy to identify. But then when you look at the vipers on the right hand side, there are instances when uh, the family member might actually kill the snake. Like you know, in uh, uh, like in Delhi where I've been working, I had instances when I was an intern and a dead snake was brought by the family member because they used a big stick or a lati to kill the snake after it bit the family member. So a dead snake was also brought into the casualty and that was actually a viper. At that particular point of time, I did not know which variety of viper. So you have to be aware of these two vipers that I've shown here. One, you can see very beautiful design on the body of this viper. This is the, you know, the British name Russell viper. On the other hand, the next snake you can see, the, the scales on this are relatively rough, so it is called as saw scaled viper. You are aware of the fact that viper bites would contribute to hemotoxicity, that will con contribute to bleeding manifestations in a patient and even hemoglobinuria and a renal failure in a patient. The last one that is shown here on the extreme right hand side is a hump nose viper. Now why we need to know about the last viper that is hump nose viper is because the anti-snake venin which is available in our country does not work against hump nose viper. Even this will contribute to hemotoxic manifestations, even this will contribute to bleeding manifestations and sometimes if a person does survive, the bleeding manifestations of hump nose viper can go on for as long as 3 weeks. The coagulopathy component can go up for as long as 3 weeks and uh, therefore, just an MCQ statement that I'll reiterate once again. The question will say that the anti-snake venom does not work against which of the following. The answer is the extreme right hand side hump nose viper. You see the bite of the poisonous snake versus a non-poisonous snake though they teach that in forensic medicine with a lot of confidence because of the soft tissue swelling that might be associated with the bite lots of time when the person is brought to you in the casualty the local swelling will make it very difficult for you to identify where it, whether it was a poisonous or a non-poisonous snake. Just to explain to you the caseload here about 50k 50,000 deaths in India are reported on a yearly basis only because of snake bite. Because majority of Indian population is living in villages, the textbook says that 50 million people are exposed to the risk of getting a snake bite which could be specially increased in monsoon season or when they go for harvesting season in the field, they could be bitten by a snake and uh, by the time they reach the hospital, they might be dead. The good news is, however, that 70% of the bites that occur are non-venomous. When it comes to bite from a venomous snake, lots of time it might be a dry bite. What I mean by dry bite is that the snake might bite at an angle that it is able to inject its teeth or fangs into the body of the person but it may not be able to inject the poison because the person will perceive the pain and will move the arm away. So due to the sudden flinging movement of the arm of the person or leg of the person, there is a possibility that the angle at which the, the snake tried to bite the person, that angle may not be very perfect for the injection of venom into the body of the person. Second, there is a possibility that person might be wearing clothes or might be wearing shoes, it might be like open sandals partially so the toes are exposed but some part of the foot is covered by sandals so because of the clothes because of sandals because of shoes because of the incorrect angle of bite the reaction of the patient to avoid that bite all of these can actually result in uh, the venomous snake not being able to inject the venom into the body of the person so first of all just get the data right 70 percent of bites are going to be non-venomous and 50 percent of the bites which occur from a venomous snake may not result in a in venomation of the patient that is no manifestations would be occurring in a patient they might actually be dry bites it is mainly due to the fear 
of uh, i would say the fear of dying that might contribute to excessive catecholamine release from the body of the person and he might combine the symptoms of like heaviness in the chest and breathlessness and his pupils will all be dilated so you might get a uh, impression as if he is having features of envenomation but then gradually you will realize that all of these are related to the fear component that has come due to the thought process that he might die after a snake bite what are we going to do in a case of a snake bite the first aid component the mnemonic for that is very well known to us that is first aid do it right what i mean by first aid do it right is r would mean reassure the patient as i explained to you immobilize the patient do not make the person walk the person should always be carried because if he will walk the venom will spread faster in the body so immobilization of the person has to be done g s stands for go to the hospital and t stands for tell the doctor of the systemic symptoms that might have occurred let's quickly revise the right would mean one r would mean reassure the patient as i explained to you that nothing is going to happen majority of bites are going to be with non venomous snakes i would mean immobilization carry the patient g h is go to the hospital and then tell the doctor of the systemic symptoms and please remember at the moment the current concept is that there is no rule of any tourniquet in earlier times they recommended tourniquet even in hindi movies they show tourniquet being tied and lot of other things being done none of them have been documented because once the venom is injected into a blood stream it will anyway start causing manifestations in a person so cutting of the local area or electrocautery of the of that particular area or letting that area bleed is not going to let the toxin escape because it has already been injected into the blood stream of the patient no tourniquet no cutting no electrocautery is the current representation and as i said no walking obviously immobilization of the patient is of paramount importance this will also ensure the fact that the heart rate of the person will tend to remain you know relatively lower as compared to that on walking because um, the faster the heart will beat the faster the circulation will flow faster the venom will tend to flow in the body of the person in the api protocol they have also said or have just mentioned one line regarding nitrogesic ointment nitrogesic would be local nitrate ointment that can be applied at the local part though the validity of this or the efficacy of this has not been proven but still api textbook has mentioned nitrogesic or nitrate spray being applied locally at the site of the bite though there are no real clinical trials determining the efficacy of it but still since it is mentioned in the textbook i just thought that it could be one of the choices in the question which might say all are true about uh, management of a snake bite so obviously it is no of these aspects and then nitrate application which is again beginning with n so just remember the fact that nitrate spray or nitrogesic ointment application is also recommended though as such it has not been proven to have any great efficacy when it comes to clinical trials so why a no tourniquet one of the reasons for that could be development of pressure necrosis because of the tourniquet per se you see the snake bite itself will contribute to local swelling and a possible compartment syndrome to add insult to the injury if you tie a rope or a cloth around that area or a metal wire around that area and then tighten it then the chances of compartment syndrome worsening will definitely increase so pressure necrosis is on its way and the person might even lose the limb and even might require a amputation the second problem will be that suppose the tourniquet is in place like a person from rural india from faridabad ghaziabad you know peripherals was brought into your tertiary care hospital and he is having a tourniquet in the leg above knee below knee where what would you do obviously if you cut the tourniquet the escape of the toxin the neurotoxin will suddenly uh, come into the venous circulation so there could be sudden deterioration of a patient including diaphragmatic paralysis in a person or there could be sudden hypotension occurring in the patient because the toxin will contribute to vasodilation histamine release i don't want any of these to happen so what will you do you will apply a bp cuff proximal to the tourniquet and inflated to a pressure almost equivalent to that of actually the tourniquet and then you cut the tourniquet you will deflate the bp cuff gradually in the patient let let me say every 15 minutes you can gradually deflate and by that time the anti snake venin administration would have already started in the patient so you will now be having anti snake ven venom present anti snake venin present in the circulation to neutralize the venom of the venom of the snake so i repeat that again no tourniquet why because on cutting of the tourniquet two things can happen and that has happened a couple of times that the doctor had to cut the tourniquet anyway to relieve the local obstruction or the local swelling of the affected part to save the affected arm and what happened was a development of diaphragmatic paralysis because the neurotoxin can contribute to 
or respiratory arrest and apnea in the patient. Second, due to release of histamine, there could be a sudden onset hypotension and to resuscitate a person like this who is had a snake bite at the moment and suddenly the BP will crash. So it becomes little difficult for you to manage the patient. So it's always a good idea to in inflate a BP cuff proximal to the tourniquet and then gradually deflate the BP cuff in the patient. Remember the fact that cobra bite is a neurotoxic bite. You all know that in fact, well, it will affect post synaptic transmission. The action of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction is the one which is hampered in this case. When it comes to a crate bite, however, it will mainly be affecting presynaptic transmission that is the release of acetylcholine at the neuromuscular junction will be hampered or will become relatively lesser. I would just like to remind you like in botulinism there is decreased acetylcholine release, in myasthenic gravis there is damage to receptors. So similar sense I am talking about cobra bite, postsynaptic and crate bite being presynaptic. Then renal failure can occur with respect to viper bites. Do remember renal failure is mainly a presentation with bite of Russell viper and second is seen with hump nose viper. Hump nose viper bite can contribute to hemorrhagic manifestations that can persist for weeks altogether. And the anti-snake venin which is available in India does not work against ASV, does not work against hump nose viper, bite, acute kidney injury, acute tubular necrosis, renal failure, uremia are the terminologies that can be used by the examiner. These are the aspects that I would like you to remember when you are administering first aid to any case of a snake bite. Also remember the fact that you should be giving ASV within 4 hours of the bite to the person. The MCQ statement which is very important for this topic is to be remembered as bite to needle time should be kept under then the answer to this should be remembered as 4 hours. This is just similar to what I have taught in the topic of acute ischemic stroke to you that thrombolysis and acute ischemic stroke should be done within a window period of 4.5 hours or in cases of ST elevation MI I have said that a person should be given thrombolysis within as early as 30 minutes of arrival into the hospital or from 12 hours of symptom onset. Similarly ASV that is anti-snake venin by 20 time should be kept under 4 hours. So we shall be talking about what will be the manifestations that will occur in a person having a viper bite versus a cobra bite. The technical terms that will be used in the MCQ will say viper envenomation manifestations or all of the following except and its bleeding that is mainly to be remembered. Obviously after the snake bite there would be local pain and development of tender lymphadenopathy that is noticed in viper bite and is not noticed with a cobra bite or a crane bite. Then are bleeding manifestations. So one of the early bleeding manifestations that you can notice is in the subconjunctival area in the patient. The MCQ can say this fracture feature that is subconjunctival hemorrhage or as you can see in the image superiorly the person is having bleeding from the gums or it could be bleeding from the nose of the patient that is epistaxis. Then a definitive life threatening gum bleeding can also be a feature that could be developing in these patients. The person would be having severe abdominal pain that is because of the bleeding in the mucosa of the stomach. Due to combination of bleeding as well as vomiting which will both contribute to fluid loss from the body, the blood pressure of the person can decrease dramatically. Reasons for decrease of blood pressure, one can be release of histamine, another one can be vomiting that will contribute to fluid loss, then blood loss, so all contribute together to a blood pressure of the patient becoming unrecordable. On the body of the person, multiple blue spots can be seen that can be palpable, that is purpuras, meaning of the word purpura is palpable bleed in the skin. In the abdomen, it could be bleeding in the mucosa of the stomach or they can be retroperitoneal bleeding occurring in a patient which will cause excruciating abdominal pain. So one of the symptoms that could be written in the MCQ could be abdominal pain and then there would be change in the color of the urine of the person. The reason for that would be that the RBCs will now be destroyed. So hemoglobin will come in the urine that will cause hemoglobinuria. So the tubules will get blocked by hemoglobin. The manifestations that can be written in MCQ can either be the word acute tubular necrosis or he might say flank pain in the patient 
or tenderness at the costovertebral junction or costovertebral angle in the patient or he can just say the fact that the person is having a dark urine or a black color urine that signifies hemoglobinuria which is occurring in a patient so viper and n venomation will always be having these manifestations in contrast if it is neurotoxic the term that he will use would be elapid n venomation let us now study what are the manifestations and how are to be they are to be remembered and you can remember them as four p's what i mean by four p is that first person will be having paralysis of levator palpebrae superioris so there will be ptosis there would also be paralysis of the extraocular muscles that will contribute to double vision or diplopia or you might write the word ophthalmoplegia so ocular manifestations will be the first one to usually develop after a person has had a elapid and venomation that is neurotoxic bite occurring from either a crate or a cobra the next manifestation will be life threatening because there would be paralysis of the jaw and of the tongue of the patient one of the problems with this would be that he will not be able to swallow his saliva so you will notice a lot of frothing at the corners of the mouth and pooling of secretions that is occurring in the mouth of the person can contribute to aspiration also and therefore lot of these patients might die because of aspiration pneumonia because the diaphragm will also get paralyzed so there would be a paradoxical respiration in a individual so the four piece to be remembered by you are as follows that is eye involvement jaw involvement then pooling of secretions contributing to aspiration and a paradoxical respiration developing in a person some people instead of remembering it as 4 p's tend to remember this as 4 d's so let us also study what are the 4 d's which are seen with this condition which can be obviously worked out from the following manifestations only one the d is obviously because the eye ocular muscles are involved so there is a diplopia in the patient the next manifestation will be dysphagia that's because the tongue is getting paralyzed in the person and then would be the paralysis of the vagus nerve that can contribute to unclear speech in a person so he would write the word dysarthria or dysphonia dysarthria implies unclear speech in a person he will not be able to talk and because of the diaphragmatic paralysis there would be breathlessness occurring in the person so that is up to you whether you want to remember it as 4 d's or you want to remember it as 4 p's that's up to you but the bottom line is very straight forward that when it comes to a elapid and venomation there is a development of descending paralysis in a patient like you are aware of the fact that gulian barre syndrome is an example of ascending paralysis poliomyelitis is an example of descending paralysis today we will discuss cobra bite and crate bite is also an example of a descending paralysis so the technical difference between the two i hope you remember is that cobra bite would be post junctional and when it comes to crate bite it would be a pre junctional manifestation that would be occurring in the patient so these are clinical manifestations that would be occurring in a person and they are indications so you have to give a asv to the person let's quickly look at the workup of these patients and then the asv administration would be instilled in the patient we will study the dose of asv that is required and most of the time we require something between 10 to 20 vials though there are studies where from kerala especially they have used up to 50 units of asv in a person but most of the time in our hospitals between 10 to 20 vials are used and there is also a particular guideline which says that suppose you don't have 10 vials whatever you have you have to give to the person because we want you precious utilization of resources so sometimes the government might provide you with only 5 vials available at your hospital at the moment so he says don't wait for the 10 vials to come and then at start treatment give whatever is available for the person because the the faster you act the more is the chances of ensuring survival in any case having n venomation manifestations ranging from either viper or a elapid n venomation the test that you will do for the workup of this person would be called as 20 wbct test that is a 20 minute whole blood clotting test you will take 2 ml blood sample of the patient that is a venous sample and place it in a glass test tube which should be dry let it stand vertically for 20 minutes in normal circumstances the coagulation system will work flawlessly and there would be a firm clot developing in the tube and even if you turn the tube by 90 degrees the the clot will retain its position but if a person is having n venomation then you will notice that the clot will degrade on turning the test tube to one side so either the clot will be very friable or the blood will fail to clot whatsoever so 20 wbc ct that is whole blood clotting test is the first test to be performed in the patient the test should be repeated at least every 30 minutes for the first 3 hours of admission 
he says after three hours because anyway we have given or initiated asv in the person remember i told you that the bite to the needle time for asv should be kept under four hours so once you have started uh, administering asv to the patient the parameters will start improving in the person and then the test can be done on a one hourly basis but initially it should be done every 30 minutes Along with this, other tests to be performed are complete blood count, metabolic profile in the form of LFT, KFT, KFT especially because I want to have a baseline serum creatinine of the person because there is a possibility of acute kidney injury in a patient. Coagulogram will also be done. We will check for bleeding time, prothrombin time, activated partial thromboclastin time in the patient. As I said, coagulogram facilities may not be available at night time or in a peripheral center. So 20 WBC C T test will be the first one to be performed. Coming to the core issue, what will be done for management of this person? The first and the foremost step is to talk to the person in a calm, reassuring voice and take care of the pain component and the fear component. For pain, he recommends paracetamol and not any standard painkiller. I've already explained to you that if a tourniquet is in place because cultural practices will ensure application of a tourniquet, apply a BP cuff above the level of the tourniquet and once you cut the tourniquet then you should gradually deflate the BP cuff in the person. This is basically to prevent sudden release of venom into the blood circulation contributing to either a respiratory paralysis or a hypotension. The most important step on which you will always be asked in the exam is regarding polyvalent ASV which does not work against a hump nose wiper. The dose of anti-snake venin or ASV will be same for both children as well as, as well as for adults. That's again a MCQ statement because the snake will inject the same amount of venom in both an adult, child or pregnant lady. I repeat my statement once again. Dose of ASV in child and pregnancy is same as that of adults because we need to, need to neutralize the amount of toxin the snake has injected into the body and a snake will not discriminate obviously between an adult and a child. It is 10 to 30 vials that are recommended though there are studies from Kerala where they have used up to 50 vials in patients. MCQ wise remember half-life of ASV is 90 hours so there is no need for re-administration of the Indian ASV the American ASV might have to be repeated after 48 hours but in Indian ASV because the half-life is very long so we do not require a re-administration in the patient. Also remember one vial can neutralize that's again a MCQ statement 6 mg of Russell Viper Venom. So we will have a look at the data once again the door to needle time for myocardial infarction is 30 minutes here i am teaching you regarding a parameter which is called as bite to needle time this should be kept under four hours so there is no there is no door to needle time it is bite to needle time that i have highlighted before you as under four hours so we will talk about indications of asv in a person and when you are giving asv to a person because anaphylactic shock can occur so keep adrenaline ready i mean keep adrenaline in the syringe ready in the syringe ready for administration if anaphylactic shock will occur and how would you know anaphylactic shock is occurring after administration of asv there would be strider in a person there would be cyanosis there would be crashing of the blood pressure so load adrenaline into the patient and you should be ready in advance Indications for ASV, I'll teach you six of them out of which the first two I usually don't find people having a problem with. The one, the first point to be remembered is coagulopathy, the bleeding manifestation. You can remember it from the image I showed you person was having bleeding from gums and the bleeding became so extensive that he developed even a hypotension. So ASV is definitely warranted in this case. Point number two to be remembered is neurotoxicity. To remember neurotoxicity, I taught you about four P's in the patient, which would be ptosis, then would be paralysis of the jaw, pulling of secretions, and dyspnea developing in a patient due to paralysis or diaphragm. Now, in the casualty, when the case has come right now under pressure, you may have difficulty in remembering the four P's. So, I'll try to simplify before you. That is one, ask the person to raise his neck. Like he is lying in the hospital bed, you are given a command, raise your neck. So, if a person is having paralysis, then he may not be able to raise his neck. It's an easy, easy test to perform. And then another test you can perform is like asking to count 1, 2, 3, 4 or A, B, C, D or whatever. So, single breath count. 
they will give you an idea regarding the severity of neurotoxicity that is present in an individual and most people who are having a neurotoxicity will not be able to count properly or will not be able to raise their neck so it's a very objective and a quick assessment that tells you the fact that the person has deteriorated and asv is warranted right now then will be cardiovascular abnormalities in a person the cardiovascular abnormalities can range from hypotension or development of tachyarrhythmias in a patient which can range from ventricular tachycardia to ventricular fibrillation in a patient the fourth indication for why asv should be given is severe vomiting and abdominal pain there can be two explanations for the vomiting and the abdominal pain component of the patient i will say the more dangerous one first retroperitoneal bleeding to diagnose retroperitoneal bleeding you will finally have to do a ct abdomen or a mri abdomen and they may not be available right now so first give asv to the patient straight away on clinical grounds because you are suspecting a retroperitoneal bleed and secondly he could be bleeding in his stomach that that will irritate the stomach because also he can be puking again and again point number 5 and 6 are related to swelling one is that the severity of the local swelling is so much like this person was bitten on the hand or on the big toe of the foot and the local swelling in the arm is more than half of the circumference of the arm or more than half of the circumference of the leg you are having a extensively swollen leg or arm in a person more than the uh, routine the circumference i mean more than half of the total arm circumference of the leg circumference it indicates asv to be administered second is that the swelling has extended rapidly that could be maybe after cutting of the tourniquet a rapid extension of the swelling this is rather a vague terminology but it says rapid extension of the swelling above the level of the waist is a indication for administration of asv in a patient one and two are very straightforward but it is 3 4 5 6 that we will revise again that is hemodynamic instability retroperitoneal bleed presenting as abdominal pain swelling in the arm which has more than which is more than half of the circumference of the arm the arm is swollen very big or when you cut the tunica there was a sudden increase in the swelling which from the leg has extended up to the waist of the person so these are the situations in which asv is to be given immediately to the patient now as i explained to you that anaphylactic shock can occur so to prevent reaction to asv we usually give hydrocortisone 100 mg along with chlorpheniramine maleate that is avil injection or antihistaminic drug to the patient so hydrocortisone or and h1 blockers should be administered immediately in all patients who have who are in the process of receiving a asv to minimize the reaction and if there is any indication of anaphylactic shock then in those circumstances give iv adrenaline i would like to draw your attention to the fact that normally in anaphylactic shock we give intramuscular but in this case let me say it's a viper bite you giving intramuscular there could be local hematoma and if the bp is very less the intramuscular adrenaline may not be absorbed so he says categorically that in a case of a asv if anaphylaxis is occurring in a person you have to give iv adrenaline to the patient this iv adrenaline would be given undiluted to the patient that is 1 is to 1000 that is obviously risky because it can trigger tachyarrhythmias also but that is why i was saying that giving asv can also be a dicey situation however if anaphylactic shock will occur in a person how would you pick up development of anaphylactic shock sudden crushing of bp in the patient with laryngeal edema strider sinuses spo2 falling in a person then you have to give intravenous adrenaline mark my words here routinely in anaphylactic shock we always give intramuscular adrenaline but in this case he says don't use intramuscular because there are two reasons one if it is a viper bite you inject into the muscle it will cause a hematoma second the bp is too less absorption may not occur because the bp is already less because of the snake bite plus the anaphylactic shock will cause further crushing of the bp so absorption can be erratic so this is one situation in anaphylactic shock where he has mentioned iv adrenaline to be given to the patient i would like to clarify this statement once again if a question simply says what is management of anaphylactic shock first line management is intramuscular adrenaline it that is undiluted format and anaphylaxis i have handled separately so you can listen to that section but in case of a asv because of the high incidence of allergic reaction severe enough to cause anaphylactic shock he mentions that keep adrenaline ready in a syringe attached to a three way stop cap and you can just uh, inject it via the three way into the main line and flush it with saline subsequently so that it reaches up to 
the target organs and thereby reduces the laryngeal edema component of the patient. Once you have done this activity, the chances of survival of the person will definitely increase. So towards the end of the discussion, we will have a, a quick look at the clinical features of a snake bite. You see, when it comes to cobra and crate, both will be resulting in development of neurotoxicity in a patient. But please remember the fact that neostigmine ad administration, that is the next point of our discussion, neostigmine administration is going to work in both cobra bite and a crate bite, though he is mentioned plus minus for neostigmine for a crate bite. So, ASV is the primary treatment, which is a yes for all of them. You can see that ASV is a no with respect to a humped nose viper. Also, notice the fact that in this table, renal failure is given for only two that have sensitized you right in the beginning. Renal failure is a feature of Russell viper bite and a humped nose viper. But renal failure is not mentioned for a saw scaled viper. So I'll reiterate my statements once again. One, neurotoxicity is both with cobra and crate bite. Cobra was post synaptic. This was pre junctional. Neostigmine, therefore, may or may not work in a crate bite, but will work in case of a cobra bite. Therefore, the next point after the management of a snake bite with ASV, we need to remember regarding neostigmine administration in the patient. Neostigmine should be combined with atropine for obvious reasons. We don't want a cholinergic crisis to be triggered in the person. I repeat my statement once again. Neostigmine is mainly for neurotoxicity but should be combined with atropine and will work only in two situations. Renal failure is a feature that is seen only with Russell viper and a hump nose viper. Hump nose viper ASV will not work in that case. These are the basic treatments that you need to remember and this table is something that if you go through it, it will always give you more, uh, I would say, leverage in the exam to answer regarding this question. Post administration of ASV, once you have handled the anaphylaxis component, recovery will definitely start in the patient and recovery starts as early as 30 minutes. How would you know that the person is improving? You will notice BP will start improving. The earlier BP was unrecordable, now it has become recordable. If the person was having life-threatening bleeding, that will begin to reduce. And you will also notice the neurological symptoms will start reducing within 30 minutes of administration. So ASV works very fast. Only the side effect of anaphylaxis has to be handled. And within 30 minutes, there is a definitive improvement in the patient. Laboratory parameters will take their own sweet time to resolve. Like it might take 6 hours for the 20 WBC test to improve. But that laboratory parameters we are not worried about. But the life-threatening part of the disease is definitely over. So the main aspects that I would like you to remember is one is first component that I explained where I taught about not making the person walk and then not applying a tourniquet in the person carry the person to the hospital ASAP as early as possible following the first aid component I have spoken regarding management of pain in this person with help of paracetamol then I've talked about that these persons should be administered ASV on a priority basis between 10 to 30 vials the dose of ASV will remain constant in both children pregnancy and adults Neostigmine is to be administered for the neurological manifestations occurring post a cobra bite in a person. Neostigmine may or may not work. He is written plus minus for a crate bite but definitely for a cobra bite. So these are some of the basic things that you have to administer to a person and the bite to needle time should be kept within 4 hours. So keep studying guys, keep focusing on the topics and uh, we will now prepare a different topic of emergency medicine after this. But keep your focus on and as more and more learning of facts you will do, you will become wiser because this is all about how much mental power you have and uh, the more mental strength you have, the more knowledge you have, then the questions that you are able to solve would be much much increased and your ability to focus and learn facts will also keep on increasing with continuous learning. My, my suggestion to you while I'm finishing this topic is that learn a new topic every day. Don't try to, you know, pile up the data in the end and then try to do, you know, whole of medicine in 10 days or 15 days. The pressure builds up. Like, try to do it like one topic a day, like you've done this topic today, then attempt MCQs of the same. And then, yeah, do it a second time because when you do it a second time, you might pick up a lot of facts that I have said, but you neglected them initially. But when you listen to them the second time because you've done MCQs also, so you will realize that, okay, I listened to this point but I overlooked it but that point is definitely important so the more you listen the more repeated listening you do the more practice you do the wiser you become and we are in the business of saving lives guys as I've said I mean that's not a joke so well this topic is definitely worth its effort
Thank you so much for listening.